but yeah. Oh, so you're in um, you're in something that uh, I get jealous of. You're in a basement, aren't you? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. I'm in a biz nice. I growing up in New England, I never realized how special basements are. But I'm since a kid, kid um, they're great for reptile rooms. They're great for workshops, uh, renovating and turning it into a you know a hangout room and. Yeah, they're awesome. They're just why they don't do them in in out west. It's kind of it's always been bizarre to me. Yeah, I wonder if it's earthquakes. Uh, I I don't know, but uh, that would make. Sense. But when uh, I talk to my friends back east and their basement is the size of my house, I start thinking, huh? <laughs> yeah. No, this is this. Yeah, I turned it in. This is my home uh, machine shop. Um, I also have like a bit in grinding equipment, and because uh, I am, as as you know, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, yeah. uh, um, and man manufacturing quality kind of guy. And so I make things like I got 3D printers and a milling machine and a, a lathe. I even just milling machine for my home shop. Um, I even have, I have gear here, metal. So I do, um, what's called investment casting. It's the same, it's the same jewelry, uh, where you basically print or mold something from wax and then you pour plaster around it. You burn out the actual wax and then you pour monster mold. Um, so kind of, kind of do it all down here. Uh, but this was prototype it was down in my basement. All right. Well, I just learned something about you. I didn't know. And, uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got to bring on Mr. Mike Titula is in the house. Is this, is it working? It is working. It, well, at least we can hear you. Can you hear us? Cool. Yes. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Welcome Mike. Yeah. Well, we were uh, just talking about uh, Tim is in a basement that's quite spacious, and I was being very jealous uh, because <laughs> I don't get ba do you get basements where you are? Yes. Yep. I'm in a basement right <laughs> now. Come on. <laughs> all right. He's in a well, <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, we're um, <clears throat> we actually learned something about Tim this morning. Oh. And uh, we're going to have to ask him to explain. Apparently, he loves vintage turn of the century fans. Uh, yep, vintage fans. <clears throat> so, Tim, could you give us a little bit of a tour and explain your your love for vintage fans? So, yeah. So, for, first, to understand the kind of reasoning behind Serene, we make pumps. Okay, so we make fairly in innovative pumps from brushless DC motors. And uh, I've always had this love for electric motors. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I remember little electric uh, race cars and like always wanting to take, take them apart, put them back more into electric motors than I ever was into like taking apart a lawnmower or something. So some sometime toward the beginning of starting my career, Career in ecotech and building that found out that, that these old, old cast iron brass antique fans existed i had never even known and as soon as i found saw my first one cool and so, you know here's an example of one um yeah out of, actually out of lancaster pa um it, it's a really rare company and then you know these are the, the blade um, this one's actually broken, so I'm in the process of repairing it. But then it works for all, all kinds of people in this in this industry. So, like, here's an example of an electric. Uh, it's actually their first ever production fan. Uh, um, this is a cage. Produced two of them for some friends. So this this is my work in progress. Uh, you know, make all these little parts for it and uh, put it all together. And then I showed Bill on my milling machine, my tool, one of my toolkits, my, uh, that's actually South Bend lathe that has a war production board. 
uh, engraving on it, and then in progress or whip from the manufacturing world. Um, that's just all fans that are sent through and, and get, the, uh, awesome. get the job done. Yeah. So cool. And it's been a passion of mine for actually close. Hey, oh, hey guys. We have we have greetings from Tanzania. Uh, oh, even though that... I don't have a name on that, I bet you that's Mark Shirts. Oh, that would be cool. Hello, Mark. If you're watching this, if that was you. <laughs> hey, Mark. Yeah. Mark if, if, if tell you what, we would all love, love some pictures of uh, all kinds of chameleons. But man, I, I personally would love some. That is um, one of my, my favorite little chameleons. Uh, um, I was fortunate of them. And uh, it was, it was, it it was sad. They had up to like thirty of them at one point, and then, and then we just started having issues with egg supplementation. I was doing something wrong. Well, Mike, <clears throat> what's in your basement? Uh, not a bunch <laughs> We're of fans. exploring everybody's basement here <laughs> <laughs> because I, I got to live vicariously through you guys. <laughs> um, currently. Like, my girlfriend and I live with her parents, so it's basically just, like, a finished basement from them. So it's just, like, another living area, essentially. And then like this, the reptile room, is also in the basement as well. This is just, like, a room in the basement. I think ba okay. basements make the absolute best reptile rooms. They're so Absolutely. well Absolutely. I remember, yeah, I had my original reptile room was, like, in my bedroom on the second floor of, like, my house back in Calgary. And holy smokes, that thing was a nightmare to keep cool. Like during the summer with all the heat lights and, and the sun would like directly come into my room as well. So it was bad. We ended up installing uh, <laughs> a screen, like a closing door, like you would to like a patio or whatever, onto my room to keep the cats out, but have the door still like airflow moving through the room. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, the basements are, um, they tend to stay cooler because they're, you know, 12 feet underground. Um, uh, and then on top of that, they tend to have higher humidity and retain humidity a lot better. 50% baseline, which is just a million times better than the average home. Um, and it's a lot easier to work with. And then you get, you really do, you get at night naturally. Uh, growing up, uh, um, I was keeping uh, back during the CIN uh, heyday, and, and I was keeping some of the montane species, um, uh, what we now know as Peretti, uh, but called Vitershimai back then, DM, and of yep. course Quadricornis. Uh, um, they were all really, really quite, uh, I had tremendous luck with montium especially. Um, Bread, uh, uh, bread, and um, and I remember with the montiums, one of the things that made them just so eggs inside the flower pots, and they wouldn't care. They'd be totally happy. They'd excavate completely on their own back, and and uh, and I, I could tell and just lift the the flower the, the plant. The eggs would be right on the side. Mm -hmm. They were. I wish we had them again because everyone loves them. The reason. Um, but, uh, what, are, their camera, the quadricornis, I know, that's Cameroon, right? Yeah, quadricornis is Cameroon, and, uh, Gracilia goes into Nigeria, but Nigeria is kind of a mess. We're not getting anything out of there. Okay. Um, but, oh, by the way, uh, we, uh, uh, Tim has a, or not Tim, uh, Mark has a question. Uh, which species, what did you want photos from, uh, from Tanzania? The uh, I I you got gotta tell me if I'm butchering the genus, but Repelli uh, brevicaudatus, the uh, <sighs> the bearded pygmy, one of my absolute favorites. Yeah. I just call him potato. But my first uh, name. Yeah. Yep, that was the first one. All right. Well, I got a question for you, Tim. Uh, you are now establishing a species, working on establishing the canopy chameleon first for Wilsey in captivity. Um, especially you who has access to just about anything because of your contacts. 
Uh, I understand the burden of that. How do you focus on one species? You, you've done very good with carpet. We'll see. You've done very good as far as focusing and not just getting everything in the candy store. How so do you do that? This is actually a personality trait. And it's it's really just second nature. I I tend to over one particular thing and want to get really good at it. So when I first first got back into chameleons, so I had taken a little bit of a hunters as pets and stuff. I had taken a little bit of a hiatus and got back into chameleons. So, um, and when I did, I was. I was no good. I had, you know, Fantasticus, Parsonii, um, uh, Will Cillians, um, and I, I had them all. And uh, it just reminded me very, this isn't the way to do it. Um, and, and so I, at that time, my folks, the, the Will C I so I, watching, watching our video last night, I remembered something, probably in like 19... 98. Artie Abadi uh, wrote an article in the Chameleon uh, newsletter talking about, about the fact that, you know, Madagascar has been closed for probably, but surely one day it would likely open up again. And, you know, you would have more than the, you know, Veracruz's stilet, carpets, and panthers. And during, during that article, anyone who was passionate about Aliens. spend this all in love with a particular species and research it and learn about it and uh and and in the event that madagascar opened up again on that on that, that one particular species to try and give it a shot and i kid you your old kid i i picked first for will see okay. as the one that i just thought that was so and 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 uh, for years, it was just always a, a something that I'd be able to experiment with and work with. And um, numbers during those first few years of the of the Madagascar shipments. Um, and so I got one secondhand off a guy who had had it for a long time, and I was very lucky. And uh, and then I. Um, I had just a few. I had got our first eggs, but then after that, I I, I doubled down again in in a, um, and so it was years of, of just sitting on the incubating egg able to hatch those two girls, and and another shipment came in, and I I only got chameleons during fall, by the way, guys. So this this sure. is this is the prime time to buy. Um, there's a variety of reasons for it, but most notably, they're they're reasonably how uh, they're reasonably small in, in size. So you've got a lot of young, younger animals. Um, they're not babies, but they're not adults yet. So that's always wonderful. Um, um, they would normally be going into their um, their uh, warms, and so by by bringing them in now and just a extending the through the winter it's not actually very hard for them metabolically to to our cycle um and so you get to cycle them for breeding come spring springtime uh early summer is when i see the most action um and uh, so yeah so if, if you are getting in if you do want to try try a new try wild cause which not going to judge, you know, it's for some people that makes sense. I always say that fall is the best time to buy. Like, right, the shipments that are gearing up to come in, which I've caught once. Okay. And Mike, um, just generally, let, let's talk about, go back to that, uh, uh, the focusing on one species versus getting a bunch of everything. How does that work? And it doesn't, doesn't have to be with chameleons. I mean, frogs and other things. Uh, what goes into your decisions as to how to do that? 
<laughs> I am a terrible poster boy to sticking to one genus or one species <laughs> or one order. <laughs> we have kind of everything over here. So um, I, I would say, for, like in my case, I'm just so obsessed with all of the um, intricacies, the, the beauty, the, the different like body shapes and lifestyles and stuff with the animals. And, and it's just so much fun for me to explore that world. And while, yes, obviously there is definitely merit to having people like Tim that have dedicated and have whatever 13 or 14 we'll see and, and are really doing great things. Um, I just think that for me, at least currently, it's, just, I just couldn't do that. Um, as much as I love like my tachydromus and like my spangler eye and stuff like that, I would love to focus on them, but I, in my relatively young age, I think that it benefits me more to kind of explore things right now. And then as I age and, and mature in the hobby, I can, I can kind of narrow it down a little bit more. Like I'm definitely in the more narrow phase now. I've kind of explored what I want to explore. And um, I am more focused on a few projects now. Uh, I know that probably didn't really answer your question, but. <laughs> That's the, exactly the question I answered because <laughs> okay. we keep, we keep talking about, hey, Craig's here. We keep talking hey, about uh, how it's great to uh, focus on one species, but I think um, I think we need to take a, a bit of, it, uh, of a perspective of that. That's generally when we're talking about us people that consider ourselves serious breeders. And mm -hmm. so if we're going to have 30, 30 animals – do we have 30 of all different stuff and we're breeding all different stuff or do we focus on one animal? And the, the thing we got to realize is that, yeah, we, we think it's great to focus on one animal, but if you're focusing on one animal, the assumption then is, is that you're a breeder. And mm -hmm. I think we need to get away from the idea that being a breeder is the ultimate goal of our hobby here you can have fulfillment and be a, a, a integral integral part of our community just by being a keeper and keeping your animals uh, properly and being an example of how that is. So having a wide variety of animals, there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, and I want to, we, you're getting uh, everybody here watching, you're, you're looking at a bunch of breeders. We love breeding. And so we struggle with, uh, whether we're going to breed 10 different uh, species or if we're going to uh, concentrate on one. But if you get into breeding, then you're getting into baby care. And if you get five pairs, uh, well, that is a huge uh, investment in time and lifestyle change when all those babies hatch. And so uh, please don't take us talking about how it's great to focus on one as that being what your goal should be. It's not, it's not, you can be a, a, a wonderful uh, part of this community by being just a keeper, not breeding at all. It's there's places for everyone for that. Yeah. So, and I, and we also kind of another little, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, there's also another little tidbit. So yeah, Bill brought up the, you know, if you have a bunch of, eggs that were all laid at the same time you, you may very well have a bunch of babies that all, all hatch at the same and, and uh, you might have only had you know 12 chameleons in your collection two, two weeks ago but now you've got them it's a it's quite different but then the other thing and especially this is especially true with some obscure species um the, the incubation parameters are really in specialized equipment and because every Every incubate every clock, you can choose when to initiate certain triggers. But in theory, every, every clutch is all is on a temperature path from when it's laid till when it hatches. If you have four clutches, you know two might you know decide you want four different, different high end controllable incubators. It just gets there's just a lot to it, and I don't. I think Bill's exactly right. Right. It's destination where the average hobbyist needs to go. I 
I mean, we have a lot, a lot of panther chameleons in the market, and the people who are doing the the breeding are doing a phenomenal job. If you're looking at buying a pet chameleon, there is, and I believe firmly that. Um, hey, I've had male fifteen years, and I've never bred them. I've never bred a panther chameleon in my life. I've never. Yeah, and I there is. Uh... I, I know we have this mystique around breeders, and, and I think that become that is that comes from uh, back in the '90s, '80s, and '90s, where we were trying to figure out these chameleons. We just wanted, <clears throat> we were happy that they stayed alive longer than six months. And when you actually got them to breed, and you were able to complete the life cycle and raise up babies, it's like you were the pinnacle you, of knowledge. You you figured it out. And you, you, that was our goal, is to figure this out. But we've figured it out now. We know how to keep these. And, uh, you know, panther chameleons are now a recipe. Veiled chameleons, a recipe, Jackson. And these things are easy to do. So being a breeder now is not, it shouldn't be your idea of what the pinnacle uh, that you should uh, shoot for. Uh, right now, we are able, we figured out the basics now, and now we're able to go into longevity, uh, figuring out the environment that they thrive in more. You don't have to breed for that. And so I, I think it, it would be healthy for our community to start changing our narrative and our idea of what our end goal is to be in this community. <clears throat> I think it also uh -huh. makes a huge difference of, um, like, I don't know how to put it, I guess like a first time breeder or whatever. Um, because I know when I first bred veils, I had the super trans veil chameleons, loved them. And they, like I produced them at the time. There wasn't really anybody in Canada producing them at least consistently. And for me, selling the offspring was fairly easy. I was able to either wholesale a few, I could walk into pet stores and wholesale them for them. I was able to sell a few privately as well. But I think for a lot of breeders or, or like first time breeders, if that's what you want to call them, um, I don't think they consider the market they're stepping into. And I also don't think they consider how they're going to sell all these babies, let alone incubate for them, control for that. Like for us, we have essentially three incubators we have one set to one temperature one set to the other and then we have eggs incubating like behind me here um and that's just because they incubate at room temperature so it's easy um but a lot of people don't consider what to do after the babies hatch i have friends that produce crested geckos i have friends that produce ball pythons and they're all sitting there like I i'm like feeding these babies and can't sell them because I just can't. There's no pet stores that want wholesale. Like nobody really knows about me, so I can't sell them through like social media or whatever. Like it's it's just it's definitely a much harder consideration than what a lot of people do. A lot of people say, I like this animal, I want to breed it, the end of the story. And mm -hmm. then I mean that's why we have nine bajillion crested geckos bouncing around for twenty dollars. <laughs> like it's it's something that is a much more intricate topic than I think is portrayed. I mean, you see your hobby breeders, you see people like yourselves that produce some chameleons every now and then that are really trying to produce more in, in Tim's case. And uh, it's, it's definitely a factor of, okay, well, yeah, you guys have space. We have space to house these animals. We want to make a project out of it. But if that's not the case, then you can you can run into trouble. So I think it's definitely something to consider. And what I so, love, uh, I sorry sorry I just I saw a comment that I thought was really appropriate. Is more obscure species? Do we have? Uh, is there a market for them? And uh, over common species, and it, it's so this is this is the issue. So here's the reality. There's not more of a market for the obscure species. Any more obscure species simply won't command the price. The, the supply-demand curly 
influenced by, by uh, demand in the case of reptiles, not supply, a very exotic uh, uh, chameleon, but um, um, not enough people are, um, are, you know, insecure of its husbandry parameters, of its robustness, and they're going to be hesitant to spend over a certain amount of money this new species and so what we find and bill bill is like you know kind of prime kind of people that that uh, are buying um some of these more obscure species and campana and you know all these other el- animals yeah they're rare they're they're available but it, it's uh they're mostly if you don't have a network of people that are your stuff you, you might have a really tough time getting rid of the animals because they're not going to the average buyer. I'll say this is a huge part of why we we've lost so many species and that's because uh, in captivity I mean it's because there weren't people to buy them I mean multi tuberculata the most incredible species it's Tanzanian species nobody's seen them here uh, I had one that uh, lived for uh, captive bred for 10 years, but uh, as far as I know, it was the last one in the United States. Is that what we used to call fisher eye? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then yep. fisher eye was broken up into everything. But there was a breeder who was breeding them, and they're incredible pets. Uh, but that amazing? Uh, he couldn't sell all the babies, and so he just stopped. And uh, I recognize this as the one reason why we have lost so many species. Daramensis is the same same thing. One of the nicest chameleons. Oh my goodness, Daramensis is so incredible, but they have a lot of eggs. And so you all of a sudden, and if you get two bloodlines, all of a sudden you're sitting there with what, 80 chameleons? And there isn't enough awareness in, in the market to suddenly move 80 chameleons. And so you you need to start marketing way ahead of time. And, and this is, this is why you hear me talking about the F1 generation. I, I've realized that, uh, me, me personally, my realization is that the best thing I can do for the community is not be a breeder, but actually help the breeders that are really serious, like Tim, get the word out as to how to take care of these chameleons and work with the people so they're interested and they say yeah i can do i can do we'll see i'm looking forward to we'll see so when tim and craig and michael have a bunch of babies the market is there ready to take them and then tim craig and michael can continue their work so i i've realized that's my part in all of this it's not being a breeder myself uh and and we all have a part to play and, so and craig, it's just yeah. craig just had uh uh his, his female 30 days of gestation so there's another data point okay so, so okay. we had said you know we had michael with a female that went six months um <laughs> yeah. i've had from 30 and craig just had 30 days so one thing i will say is that my females that li- that bred later had uh, shorter gestation times, but this is just, just one season of data points, so I can't. Um, but but uh, congrats, uh, Craig. It, it's fantastic, and Craig is definitely incubation parameters being a, the, the Parsoni I god that he is. So I'm I'm really within a year. Uh, um, we'll be look, looking at some some animals to trade blood, blood as well to people who want them. Um, yeah. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, and this is part of it. Now every now the community is starting to become aware of this species. And so hopefully when you guys are ready, it won't be this obscure pe- species that people are saying, eh, what is that? There will be people ready to uh, to take those babies off your hands. Uh, uh-huh. And, and something, something going back to what we were talking about as far as the changing uh, priorities in the community from being a breeder to it's okay to be a keeper working on husbandry. Uh, One thing I really love is the focus on the environment and creating the environment for the chameleon. And uh, 
you know, case in point is the uh, the leap cages, which are specifically designed to help us in the community uh, be able to do the bioactive easy. Uh, I I love that direction, and if we have that, uh, changing our focus from producing a whole lot of chameleons is the ultimate goal to producing a an incredible uh, environment that keeps a chameleon healthy and getting into the bioactive, uh, our focus becomes more healthy. And so uh, I, I see that our community is going to have a greater appreciation for the smaller chameleons like Will CI, carpet chameleons, Campani, uh, because they can be uh, more easily done in a bioactive environment and a beautiful environment. So uh, on we're, your, we're going in a healthy direction. Your, yeah, and say on your desk instead of having to buy a stand. I mean, you know, these the 22 by 17 by 24 inch uh, leaping clothes, basically a, uh, um, uh, you know, you know it, it, a studio uh, will see I um, or a, or a carpet chameleon they can easily live inside a 17 by 17 by 24 but we should always try and give more and so, so that it's a lot easier these smaller first of furs and I think that camp and I is Michael just kind of figured it out and yeah. all the early reports of uh, and uh, and neonatal death with that excuse me with that species more based on his incubation parameters that I, I believe created a healthier healthier of grass and and peas uh, for the juvenile enclosure so I mean really, we're getting there um, we're getting there for sure yeah and uh, we we some of us know uh, a little bit more about Michael than is totally public. And there is a lot of exciting things that are coming down the line. And uh, people in the community, uh, you are going to be ex uh, discovering a whole new side of chameleon keeping. Uh, it, it's it's exciting to be part of this community. And there's more to come, I can I, I can tell you right now. And, uh, it, it's It's wonderful. Uh, you know, we do have a That's question a here. Question. So uh, when we do have those more obscure species, where do they go, Tim? So <clears throat> everyone's going to have their own philosophy. Uh, I certainly, with other um, uh, people that are working and focused on the species and range trades, um, for you know, a sufficient number of them expand our bloodline count. So that's absolutely number one. Uh, um, who would be people who would approach me, seeing the social media posts of the end, and on their own volition are looking to you know see if they could get acquired it be for breeding or for pets. Um, and and, uh, and then lastly, you know, yeah available you might try and, and post them um in a general market uh for terms but um in the case of the will ci we're looking at like eight to 14 per clutch uh, uh seems to be pretty common with the lower number being um so i don't think that we're ever gonna have like so many of these that uh like I mean, I'm always optimistic, but yeah, we may get to a point where where, where I, I got some chameleons in need homes. Can can someone show me some, some interest? One is trade yeah. for bloodlines. Yeah, and we can take a look at. I mean, I, I've got to say, I have huge respect for Frank Payne and how he handled first for minor. Uh, to where he gathered up all the known bloodlines. And there is, he could have either said, okay, I am the minor king and I am going to, uh, I'm going to make sure that I am the one who continues breeding these and makes the money off of them. But he did it. He made sure that all of those babies, 
he went to other breeders. And so he is responsible if first for minor it is established as established as it is, it's because of his decision to put the community ahead of capitalism and being the, the king. And that is a an example for all of us to follow because that is taking care of the community. And uh and because of that, so the breed what what he did is he took the uh, the babies that for minor and they went to breeders. Uh females always went to the breeders, males some people got males as pets because you know we, we don't need all the males, but females are absolutely required for establishing the species. And and I would say that same model would be uh, well the healthy way for establishing any species. And so uh, uh -huh. there's so and I there's think, a, uh, males. Yeah, there's another component to kind of what I would call like like the, you know Frank Payne's philosophy. Um. We, beyond just his his uh, being, I'm not going to call it generous. He's just he's just thoughtful of the future of this beyond just his own personal fi yeah. financial interest in it, um, and free sharing of of the exact parameters that he yes. uses to achieve success. And uh, I've adopted um, us that are into this in a geeky side look, look at these guys a little bit as like a science uh like a formula and if we just know all that we can reproduce the behavior year in and year out of receptivity breeding gestation etc um, um even egg laying is a is a process to figure out with all these different animals and what what i really feel strongly about is um providing the that i have and able to uh, test and at this point that results in success. And for chameleons, there's just so, so many filming, but like to use an example, Europlatus fantasticus, we have those guys dialed in at this point. Um, we get close, close to 100% success rate from uh, egg laying from, from ha of hatches. And then once the, the animal has successfully hatched out of the egg. zero failure um absolutely mm -hmm. no deaths using the deli cup method which is and go into nursery enclosures there's a lot of ways to raise a europlatus fantastic the way we are doing things is the only way but i do know that if, if you do it exactly the way we are and so you know i i say the deli cup method well yeah okay so we're keeping them in deli cups with a plastic but that's not the deli cup method. What we learned is if we don't change the sphagnum moss three times a week, we we run into debt, and mm. uh, and we don't. That's the, those three days of moss is the only time we actually provide water into the deli cup. We moisten in the moss, put it in, mist on top. Animal goes. We food goes in. Animal goes in. Lid is closed again until you know the next. Uh, uh, substrate exchange again is that the but that's that's working well for us and um, providing that information and you start doing it exactly the same way until you have experience and you know Frank's care sheets uh, the, the the carpet chameleon uh, um, it's a form of, uh, and if you listen to the to the experts that are giving this information. You know, they, they, uh, it should be, it should be followed pretty close uh, experience of how, how and where the variables can exist. Yeah. It, having three, four different ways that work. So three, four different recipes that work is critical for all of us to figure out what, what's going on because we can then start figuring out patterns. What's common between these. And then we know what's critical and what the the buffer zone around that is, and by we can only do that if we have different recipes. So yep. this whole we got to compare notes. You yeah. know, it's all about that. Craig and I have been a few weeks once once he had the uh, Will CI uh, um, copulating because you know I guys I'm in the Northeast. I'm doing 
doing it in a controlled lab. He, he's doing it based on the weather point outside. And, and Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Will CI are mostly out wrong on that. So I'd like to make, make sure. But either way, we need to know, hey, we associated this behavior with this particular trigger, but Craig saw the same behavior without that. Maybe, Interestingly enough, uh, his... We'll see guy that just lay uh, in the plant pot uh, during the process of egg laying. I have had with Will CI. And I've never had it happen with a carpet chameleon. Twice I've had to un dig out a female Will CI after she laid the eggs. I, I don't know. I'm not even going to pretend to hypothesize what, what, what I'm doing it. Okay, and he's doing, doing it inside in a traditional non-bioactive setup. So that's good to know. All right. Well, here is a, uh, okay. Where was that question? There's so a let, let's, let's take a look at this. Do we see greater benefits Perfect. to the current bioactive trend versus the older methods of keeping? And I suppose we can break that up into adults and raising babies. Where do you, uh, so, I'll say from my, you want to say, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So man, adult, it's only been in the last year or so that Michael kind of proposed this alternative method to raising babies. So us babies, especially babies in a traditional dry, not, not bioactive chameleon enclosure set up specifically the, the and um <clears throat> and they work great for my carpet chameleon at the wheels ci i was desperate to try and figure out why the babies were only surviving for and so i was quite truly experimenting with new e eggs that were hatching to see what would work um it was that I, I had all these two and a half gallon fully planted Fantasticus. So they're set up as a terrarium, but bioactive, fully planted, peperomia, vining, evenly dense. A lot of springtails, uh, small isopods, et cetera. And the will see I inside of these, okay? Like, I, it's, it's the only other option. That was when, and, uh, when the babies actually started surviving. I think that bioactive, anyway, coming back, back to the question, I think that is most valuable for especially small chameleons. Uh, um, I also, keeping mostly small chameleons, bioactive, um, for adult chameleons. And I, I just find it to be easier. I find the plants grow more dense, which helps it more calm, calm and at home. Um, I like the fact that if you gra a gravid chameleon or you miss, you know, when she's actually looking to, um, she has the option of, of going down to the substrate to try and, and, uh, and so, Personally, for me, keeping animals in controlled environments where I'm using HVAC to get the te temperature low enough, the bio and, and, and also let me add smaller species, the bio method, active method works for me across. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's do a differentiation here. Uh, when we say strictly speaking, bioactive means we have springtails and isopods and such like that. Uh, do you think that is the uh, an important component, or is just having a naturalistic where we have soil bottom and plants? Uh, do you think that would uh, give us so, uh, the same? Effect? So what I think for there's the most is is the availability of springtails, without a doubt. And, and you know, with with conventional bioactive, you are going to have a couple other bugs that are in there too. Yeah, um, I always do. And but second to that is the 
dense nature at which a bioactive and I think so Michael really nailed that with his suggestion of peas and grasses so I had been using peperomia and other thicker stem I mean there's still tiny leaves on these peperomia but they're bigger and it, it was Michael that, that uh, and trust me guys I'm sure people have experimented this for a long time Time, but Michael proposed it, so I'll, I'll respect the the fact that he kind of presented it. Yeah, to all he us. spearheaded the, the, this yeah. movement. Yeah, and um, and so we started doing the grasses in the peas, and with the peas over the terrarium, and then if the plant actually dies away in some areas, its vine remains this lattice network of, uh, of sticks. I, I think that the three dimension of those kinds of enclosures for a chameleon um, and the availability of food is what makes it so much easier. Uh, um, it doesn't have to move far, far to get it. Um, for adult chameleons, I think it's really, you can be a little more lazy with your poop cleanup. Um, you know, you can choose one of the substrate rather than actually removing it from the enclosure that makes life easier and tails and isopods at the bottom um and i think that the, the fat grow so densely inside of these bioactive terrariums is nice for a, it's gonna be making use of a lot of sticks your, your plants are not going to be capable of providing the clean really truly needs okay well mike I wanted to ask you, you're, you work with a lot of different uh, species, and here in the chameleon community, we are really having a, a bioactive renaissance, I suppose you'd say. Uh, <laughs> how has that been in the other species and the other communities? Um, kind of similar. I, I would argue a lot of people my circle of friends and, and even me to some extent really do think that the term bioactive is overused. Um, I think naturalistic is a more holistic term, I suppose, because I'm... in my opinion, true bioactive requires, as you said, the springtails, the isopods and plants. The point of a bioactive is that those isopods and microfauna are breaking down waste uh like rotting uh, leaves whatever might be in the tank and bringing it into nutrients for the plants that the plants then export into their foliage and grow so to be a true bioactive you need those three components and i, I think it's much harder than a lot of people make it out to be and and maybe even like myself and other people make it out to be like Oh, you say bioactive because that's what gets the clicks. I mean, now every package has bioactive on it or bioactive yeah. ready or whatever. Like everything is is toting the bioactive, and and I think it's great, and I do believe in it. I mean, in my room, like here, hold on, like we have <laughs> a whole bunch of different tanks and and setups and stuff, and they are all by definition bioactive. Um, I think that it's great that no, nope, going the wrong way. There we go. <laughs> I think it's great that the chameleon community is is starting to keep them in bioactive. But even in my old videos and and some of my newer chameleon video, videos that I've made, I, I touted that glass is okay, and it oh, really is a testament it. to me. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, yep. and it's a testament to me and it shows kind of the level where the average, I guess, beginner or, or somebody that's looking for that kind of content on YouTube still doesn't necessarily believe that they still think that glass is the enemy and glass is going to cause our eyes yeah. and all this stuff. And, and like, frankly, in the comments, you see of one video particularly where I set up a, a bioactive tank for my Bradipodian, they, they said like, you know, it's constant. Oh, why do you have them in glass? Why do you have them here? Why do you have them there? Like, this is good. They're just going to kill them and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you guys, like you, you two, <laughs> the, the people that I'm talking with in, 
it's really, you know, it's not the case. And, and I assume most of this audience knows that it's not the case, but the general, general audience still demonizes glass. And, and I think that it is much easier to do an ecosystem or a naturalistic or bioactive tank, however you want to put it, in something like leap habitat or glass enclosure. Um, that the average newcomer to the hobby doesn't necessarily want to take uh, a screening plastic on the side or, or put acrylic on the inside or like make it so they can retain a lot more soil than what those are meant to retain. And uh, yeah, so I, I guess to answer your question, I think bioactive is awesome and I use it for most of our animals, but I think that it needs to be done with caution. And I also think that like a PSA is even with bioactive, most of the time you still need to remove waste. None of those isopods, none of those springtails are going to eat urates. Uh, I haven't found an animal or I guess an insect that does. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I also think that a lot of times people will set up an enclosure, put call it 20 ice or springtails in there and maybe a culture of 15 isopods and I'm like, yep, it's good. Never touching mm -hmm. it again. And then they introduce the apex yep. predator in the enclosure. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys see where I'm going with this. Like that predator now is producing a whole bunch of waste. And these isopods and springtails aren't even established to volume alone, all the addition waste coming from that a predator. So I, I like it. I do so generally think that it is good. That's, that's my thoughts. <laughs> so, Michael, to, 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 add, to add to my recommendations uh, uh, along the same lines, um, you know, yes, read on your uh, critter crew, critical. Um, yeah, there is, it, it is absolutely off poop management. There is management to do. What I would add is what we have, what we have and we did a video on this as well, um, in our uh, substrate series on, on leaps, um, we, we recommend exchanging uh, portions of the substrate in ready, the purpose of which it, you can remove more poop in the process. You uh, you acidification of, of the substrate itself um, due to the natural break, breakdown of all, and um, you introduce new organics to further break down over time. So I think it's something that we rarely talk about in in the naturalistic uh, naturalistic terrarium conversation, but subject substrate exchanges. I mean, pull off the top top layer, add a new top layer, new leaf litter. Changes should be looked at the way we look at a water change in the aquarium world. Where maybe three times a year at most, you're going in and you're pulling substrate and adding a new bag it, it works you know mm -hmm. i totally agree i i we do that all the time especially with some of our i guess larger species like the chihua and whatnot like we have to go in there and really give the cage a good clean we always check for eggs and whatnot and during that time we will add more substrate we will put a little bit more leaf litter we'll we'll refresh the tank that's that's what we call it i mean the exchange yes. is the the technical term, but yeah, we just use the like refresh. It's like, yep, you know what? I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of brand new soil and and let the isopods and, and the springtails go nuts. And the critical thing is that these early stages, right, where we're kind of terms thrown around, and some are commercialized. So, like, you know, leap. Look, we have to use it so whether we feel it's more of a, you know, markety term or not, because our our um, products have to be able to be found right and mm -hmm. people are searching yeah. bioactive that's how absolutely but, but regardless it's our responsibility as you know uh, but media term but also just in the actual term um and uh in innovator industries that we need to start formalizing what we think are make things done and we've all intuitively done substrate refreshes or exchanges creating that in, into the mantra 
of how to uh, successfully set up a, is, you know, something that we should, if we collectively feel that these are, are what work, rehitting those points over and over again so that it's easier to for the consumer to time. Um, yeah, and I think it's, yeah. it's you need the, the kind of point that it's like uh, a water change in, a, in an aquarium. And in, in my point of saying like the leaves and, and the plant matter is critical is it's the same thing. It's a, it's a nutrient export. You know, when you're, when you have an aquarium and the moss has gone crazy and it looks like a jungle, you go through there and chop it all out, refresh it. And a lot of times, if you're not careful, algae blooms happen. And that's because now the nutrients are all out of whack. There's so much less plant material. They're not actively growing anymore. And now they have to shoot off new roots and new shoots to start growing. And I, I, I look at a bioactive enclosure the same way. It's, it's truly is a nitrate export. And when you're chopping that pothos in half and putting it in a new tank, then that, that is, in sense, removing the nitrates from a tank. So that's, that's kind of how I look uh -huh. at it, at least. Going back to the glass topic, um, Stephanie Peters here mentioned some things with her in depth about the topic. because. Stephanie uh, admins on some of the alien groups, right? Right. So, so my my, my philosophy aliens and my kind of like more uh, shoot from the hip mentality of how this is more based on experience. Where Steph has reminded me that when you're talking to the, you have to present things as a formula that we know will work if you follow our formula so when she explained that to me it makes sense so the two by two by four screen enclosure is quite closure you can get for the least amount of money so mm -hmm. right away it's the de facto standard for red chameleon now it comes with it as we know certain uh deficits you can't you want to it's all screen so ventilation is an issue but that's where for the the in these groups and Bill's a part of it so he knows full well um, recommends being system a missing you know they recommend the equipment to go along with that particular you look at it as exactly that this is a recommendation for a basic kit for your panther or veiled chameleon to get that animal healthy often they're going they already come into these groups with the chameleon that has and that's where the origin of that is but then Unfortunately, what we have, have is people, um, a lot of pe people who don't even watch our side of the conversation, you know, the three of us here, where we talk about kids and how to bring them in and how to use them with the same, same basic concerns as, as are being addressed with that two by two by four. Or, but in a different for these other enclosures. And so when yeah, we say, it, yeah, the, we, need we, we know we can't, they don't necessarily know they that they, they know they probably shouldn't because they don't. Yeah, and you hit on it. The, the reason why there, it's it's a double-edged sword there because yes, we need to have a, a recipe that works with the most available cage. And unfortunately, we make it easy. It's easy to memorize. And then we have a whole, a whole Facebook worth, uh, 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 a whole Facebook group of six month experts who have memorized this and don't know what's beyond it. And they've stopped. They don't realize that's a starting point. They say, this is it. And so they that's how Mike's video. Oh, and they comment on mine. It's like, the, yeah. you, you're on my Instagram. You're telling me that chameleons have to be in mesh or screen. Do you do you know what bar you walked into? I mean, <laughs> have you been listening to anything I've been producing here? So, yeah, it is uh, it is a challenge for those of us working on the front lines to figure out how to get people started, but to also let them know there is a whole world after this and when you when you stop at that first level and decide this is the end all be all and and anything beyond this is respiratory infections 
it's like stunting an entire generation. And unfortunately, uh -huh. that's what we had on Facebook. It's like an entire generation of Facebook was stunted because of the rise of your beginner admins and uh, that mm -hmm. didn't know that there was something beyond and that you should be going to. So uh, well, and I don't I have an answer. What I owe you guys, and I know I'm working on it, I promise is a bigger enclosure for chameleons and veils yeah. into Leap. Because then then we can actually offer on our kit um, for, because that's our next step, is we're going to be kitting out product offerings by species. And um, at that point, we can offer a kit that members who want, want to take it to step you know, phase two of chameleon keeping a bird. They want to try some, something a little bit different. They can obtain the substrate, the fog, or, or the listing system and the LED and T5 lighting all yeah, at once. Tim, my main excitement about what you did with Leap is that if uh, as soon as you make a larger cage, mm -hmm. we will be able to get out of the Reptibreeze screen cage being the first cage that yeah. people start with. And we yeah. can bypass that step altogether. I mean, me with Dragon Strand, I can't, <clears throat> those are mid level cages. I can't get those cheap enough to where it becomes an entry level cage. And so right. people uh, start with the Reptibreeze. Leap is, I, I see from a community standpoint that Leap is our best chance. <laughs> at being able to get rid of that entry level step and get them into some solid chameleon husbandry yeah. without that. So yeah. that's, think, that's why I'm excited about what you're doing. To, to add to that, I think that, you know, we talk about like appealing to beginners and trying to educate people from the very beginning. And that's what life truly is. I mean, especially through if, if you've been to university or, or further education, it's, it's literally every year. It's like, forget what you learned last year. That's all BS. This is how it actually is. And it's, it, it is always progressing and, and saying, you know what? No, this, that was, yeah, that's true. But no, there, this is how it actually works. And, and that's how we have to try and balance things. I know I took a, like an education class essentially on like scientific communication. And I ended up actually posting my final project to my YouTube channel. It was a video on bromeliads. And like the point is, is figuring out how to engage a wide audience from all different age levels to all different education levels to all like the beginner walking into the hobby to maybe even an expert might learn something on said said topic um it, it's definitely it's literally a science on figuring out how to make that communication and i mean <laughs> tim has an extra step of doing it through leap and having a company with marketing and stuff like that bringing that in as well but i think it, it's awesome bill and i speak from a viewer first and saying that i've been listening to the podcast i've been engaging on instagram since it started since whatever five or six years ago and at the time i had chameleons and and now i don't but it's still a like uh, a thing that i do is listen to it because you bring such vast information from places that the hobby doesn't even realize yet and, and i think that it's like an unsung hero because i mean your your series on the veiled chameleon and how and hearing yeah. to, the data from the wild and hearing how short their lifespans typically are in the wild was like mind-blowing to me and i I'm, and then i am at work going and telling all my friends and like oh yeah no you have to go see this because all this is actually not true and and this is true and and it's yeah, <laughs> that was it, a huge growth series for me too uh, <laughs> i was learning alongside all of you but thank you very much i appreciate you saying that um no <laughs> now i know that uh it's coming time where you're gonna have to uh, uh leave us and get to some uh guests correct Yes, indeed. I, All right. I'm, so I'm going to give you a, an easy you. out here. Thank you. <laughs> the, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. And I uh, really appreciate you coming on with uh, me and Tim to introduce the Canopy Chameleon. Uh, it was, I, that was a great episode. Really appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. I greatly appreciate <clears throat> it. Uh, 
Are either of you guys going to be at Tinley? Uh, I am not. I, I am not currently planning, but I'm going to talk to the getting out there for networking and to walk the show to collect data. Um, we're playing. Uh, we're formalizing our trade show schedule for 2023. So, okay. part of many more shows in 2023. But, uh, but um, that said, though, Mike, uh, whether whether I'm there or not, we have some to try and get one of the sensor push devices if you don't already have one. Because let's get let's get numbers on your in your reptile room are and see what kind of chameleons you realistically could keep. Because the solution to a lot of these is, is just don't provide supplemental heat. You know the the yep. room temp is fine. Yeah, I will. I'll definitely. I, I'm literally going to order one at the second I hang up. I'll have some data for you. In the coming days. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Yeah, because I think right. the carpet would be great. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. Audience. Uh, Bye, Mike. The, the Chameleon Academy. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, chat with you guys later. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care. All right, Tim. We actually should be uh, wrapping it up here. We're coming to the end here. And so uh, perhaps uh, to the to the uh, viewers, do you have any last questions for Tim or me about the the topic at hand? We we don't want to open up too many new topics here. No. So what, uh, uh, Bill? We're talking canopy chameleons, the the breed of exotic species, and how to make it sustainable for the industry um, and topics, I suppose. Yeah, and I love that we are seeing a lot more community um, organization and coming together around a species. And, uh, and I'm, I've been trying to do these, uh, get other species out for long as I mean, what was it 2012? I did an article for chameleon news about the super breeders trying to encourage people to uh, focus on a, uh, a species, but the one problem with that is we would always have individual people focusing on a species and then when they were done it's gone and so but things have been changing and a lot of that has been with the organization with you frank kevin and so that like that uh pennsylvania group has been (laughs) able to expand (laughs) beyond just one breeder yeah carl could talk to you've had on your on oh yeah yeah your show and you know just an absolute <laughs> he just stays a little lifetime. in the behind the scenes <laughs> yes but daily and he has an, an entire lifetime of experience both traveling to chameleons um uh you know going to ham show and and, uh, and keep, keeping some very obs- yes he's he's not a name that uh, necessarily people right now will have known but he's been in Vinies as well and i've known him since i was a kid uh yeah the, so i mean we figured out today years yeah the but the critical critical aspect of establishing any chameleon in in the community is you have a lot of people breeding it and uh, we, we've had so many people say i'm going to be the king of this species and they try to be the king of that species and the only one of that species and it doesn't it doesn't take we need a critical mass of breeders and then a critical uh-huh. mass of people want uh being pet keepers uh-huh. for any hope of anything to be established and so uh-huh. i'm encouraged to, to see more of that happening yeah we need to share the information there are some yeah. tricks with these it takes a while to figure out what the tricks are and i'm sympathetic to you know i am sympathetic well, you know, I've spent a tremendous amount of time and money because I certainly have getting this far. But where mm-hmm. it starts to kind of fork off is I'm insecure that I am able of carrying the torch forever. And um, you know, carpet chameleon like like they're uh, like they could be you know the next big thing. But please, Frank and myself, and we're the only ones that can, that are 
consistently producing year long. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are getting in and they are having breeding success and hatching success, which is amazing. But either either one or two, one or two more people to really double down people just breeding individual pairs and releasing the babies available. Um, yeah, because I, I, myself go go out on it, it that's that's could be bad yeah and and i will say to anybody out there thinking about breeding or being the king of something or whatever the more breeders there are the more the market grows because mm -hmm. people don't want to get involved with the species that they feel alone in and so mm -hmm. For you to have customers, you need to have a lot of breeders and people to think that they can go and find this easily. That's that's well, what gives security to them. Yeah, the mark trying to get people interested in, in your obscure species of chameleon is inter without other people interested in working with it or working with it, doing marketing, you know, as well. It's just a much more difficult equation um yeah. question yeah. here about uh the bioactive substrate um how often when so i had mentioned uh that that should be done two to three times a year it's acceptable uh assuming that springtails need to be replaced as well i would isn't necessarily dependent upon when, when you do the substrate exchange um you independent of the substrate exchange schedule because with the substrate exchange you're leaving plenty of way. okay all right tim i think and uh and folks it is time for us to bring this to a close and uh tim i want to say thank you so much for coming on and thank you so much for sharing and being a integral part of the growth of the community uh, that is this is what we need and i appreciate what you're doing thank you bill um i really hope through leap the over the can uh we can you know really, really impress uh some of these chameleons with what we got to offer because i've been working a long time on it and and um you know it'll be good stuff all right, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll be back. Uh, well, I'll be back next week. But uh, yeah, don't worry. Tim will be back on this show again. We, we got more stuff in the future. So have a good Appreciate weekend, everybody. It.